title of my uh, lecture is perhaps uh, uh, a little bit too rich. There are too many irons in the fire, as we say in, Ita in Italy. Eh? Troppo, troppi ferri nel fuoco. But uh, it does have this title because it involves a series <coughs> of concepts, <coughs> episodes, that strongly belong to the history of Italian immigration. And these problems involve uh, racism, linguistic uh, issues, hardship, sacrifices, extortion, the so-called black hands, mano nera. But by the way, why mano nera? Uh, one part of the uh, one way to classify the so-called mafia was mano nera. Why? Is there anyone of you who knows that? Mano nera. Well, it's very simple, because mano nera, black hands, was based on extortion. So if you had a store in the 1910s in Brooklyn or New York, whatever, it could happen that you receive a letter in which uh, <coughs> there is a sign of uh, school with two bones and then the imprint the printing the, the, the illustration of a hand of a black hand as if it was an anonymous person writing that letter and with that warning the person would understand that that was a sign you know to pay a certain amount monthly to so-called protection from these gangs Anyway, um, as I said, as I started, the, the, this problematic carries many issues in a period that has been very passionate, very intense in the Italian-American <coughs> experience, especially, particularly, I would focus on the New York area, on the East Coast. And it was extremely uh, difficult painful, especially at the beginning, because there was almost a kind of a persecution sometimes for uh, racial reasons, because there was also strong competition among immigrants. And sometimes these episodes would end also with killing, with brutal lynching even. Uh, one of the most famous uh, facts that happened at the very beginning of our immigration took place in New Orleans, March 14, 1891. And I think, uh, not I think, it is, it is a fact that many historians consider this brutal lynching one of the most uh, disgusting in the history, in the entire history of America. A scholar who has been here many years ago in his book talking about Richard Gambino wrote that this was the largest lynching police brutal suppression and this happened almost at the end of 19th century which is the period of the first great the first phase of uh, Italian immigration and as you perhaps know or you have read, uh, at one point uh, a group of Italians were put in jail, but they resulted innocent, so they were freed. Uh, many of them belonged to, uh, they were um, Sicilian uh, fishermen, 90% uh, of them. Fishing was one of the most uh, uh, positive and active uh, resource for these people. So at one point of the population, galvanized, stimulated by, even by the mayor of the city, Joseph Shakespeare, it's an ironic last name, and uh, at one point they were excited, they were stimulated to take justice by themselves, especially because a few days after this uh, 
trial, <coughs> the police superintendent, superintendent was killed. His name was David Hennessy, 15 October 1890. And of course, immediately, uh, Italians were there. There were lo lots of Italians in New Orleans were accused for this killing. So as a kind of, uh, I quote, patriotic duty, so these people entered the prison and made justice, so to speak. So they were killed. Two were hanged up, the other nine you know, shot, and so on and so forth. So this is a, an episode that I'm just briefly mentioning to uh, recall that this particular brutal suppression is not just uh, you know, once. It took place in many, many decades. Uh, imagine that between 1882 and 1951, 4,000 victims of lynching happened in the United States. There were difficult times, very difficult times. And uh, the life of these uh, first immigrants uh, was difficult for a number of reasons that you can very well imagine. First of all, the language. And this explains also why there were, they were grouping in uh, small uh, communities because they felt more protection. They could help each other. And in somehow they could find a familiar atmosphere uh, and what were these places? Well, they were, um, especially in the lower part, of downtown in Manhattan, the lower east side, Canal Street, Mott Street, Mulberry Street. By the way, all this area today is Chinatown. Uh, plus the Bronx, the Italian Harlem, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, we can call this Little Italy, in somehow had to organize themselves because people uh, did not have access to banks. They did not have the possibility to ask for a loan, just to make an example, to start their uh, social life. So we have to uh, recognize, and I'll be very synthetic on this because the list could be very long. They started to uh, organize themselves, for example, uh, creating Society, societies of mutual help, kind of benevolent associations, if you like, uh, kind of uh, uh, humanitarian association through which they could help to lend some little money, you know, to pay the first rent, the, to, to buy maybe some uh, tools for home, and so on and so forth. So in a way, uh, this could create a certain possibility, at least to start a social and family life. In this sense, religion play, plays a very important role. Uh, why? Well, because they used to gather together in a church. Uh, it's very famous, the Mount um, 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 San Carmel Church <coughs> in the Bronx, in which they could um, organize themselves they could have uh, also some, you know, distractions, because mainly the, the, uh, the children were growing up on, on the streets. And only later on, a few years later, there was a kind of uh, educational, uh, educational programs for children of immigrants' families considered intellectually inferior. That was the, uh, the idea. So, enormous sacrifices, no protection at work at all, no medical assistance, and the living was generally in these uh, uh, apartments called the tenements, one room after another, uh, in which they would uh, live together, and the heart of the apartment would be the, the kitchen, of course. And the major part of these Italians, Irish, black people, Jewish, and so on, all immigrants, especially Italians were mainly working men in construction. 
you know, building roads, uh, bridges, uh, railroad stations, uh, pick and shovel men, and so on and so forth. But also women work very, very hard, especially in the garment industry or in the silk industry. <clears throat> and sometimes, because there was no protection, no assistance in any sense, tragic tragedies would happen. I would like to recall at least one, the famous Triangle Fire. It was a Triangle uh, Waste Company. At one point there was a fire in this building, the Ash Building, which still exists. If you like to go to see, I would suggest you, especially, I see a couple of students of mine, to see this building. The building still exists, and nowadays is uh, considered an historical place. It's a um, Washington place, and the eighth, ninth, and tenth floor there was this factory where hundreds and hundreds of women were working. And working, as I said, in a very poor conditions, uh, the door were, were locked. They could not escape. They could not, uh, it was a common practice at the, in those years to prevent workers from taking unauthorized breaks, but also to prevent or reduce theft, to avoid that thieves could enter inside the building. So therefore, therefore, when this incredible fire happened, workers, um, these women, were trapped, could not escape, and jumped from the high windows from the 8th, 9th, 10th floor. As I said today, this building, and I suggest you that you visit this building, is very touching. It's a National Historic Landmark. Uh, it's located on the corner between Green Street, it's in the village, Greenwich Village, between uh, the corner of Green Street and Washington Place. This is just some examples to give you why at one point was uh, starting protests, explosions, uh, anarchism, socialism, uh, the birth of the labor union. Uh, it's a very complex uh, portion of our history, of American history, because um, even though these, these groups were ideologically different, but they were in somehow unified in order to make a better life. So it was strange today, it is a little bit strange to see an anarchist together with a socialist, with a, a nationalist, uh, with a fascist, and so on and so forth. But the uh, common uh, intent, the common goal of this very passionate uh, period was indeed to try to fight injustice and to have a more recognized civil way of living. And we can remember that, for example, uh, one of the most uh, uh, feverish uh, uh, leaders were Luigi Galliani. Uh, he was the editor of several magazines. One of these was La Questione Sociale. The other one was Cronaca Sovversiva. Uh, he arrived to, yes, to the United States in 1901, which is precisely the same year for those of you who use my book, Migrating Words, by the way, read the first two chapters. They are, they are very, if, I, uh, if you allow me to say that, very illuminating to clarify this very tormented period of American history. Um, he arrived in 1901, so in a way, symbolically, also chronologically, uh, signs a date very important because it's the same year when many other important leaders from Italy arrived. Uh, I will talk later on shortly about uh, Arturo Giovannitti. He was uh, one of the union leader, a very <coughs> important, uh, committed man for the cause of these workers. He also arrived in 1901. You have to understand that between 19, 
1985 people would arrive daily, not every one, not, not every week or every month, daily, every day, has been calculated to Ellis Island. 185 immigrants. And so you can imagine how, <laughs> what was the atmosphere arriving at Ellis Island daily with the, uh, I described the visits, there were several checkups, they were marked with a piece of chalk and you had to go, uh, for example, uh, E for eyes, if, you, if the, the controller saw some problem, or H for heart, and so on and so forth. And then they had to go to a more detailed visit, there were several passages, at the end of which uh, you were maybe allowed to enter the United States, or you were deported, simply. Sometimes, not sometimes, many times, family were split, were divided, because one member was uh, not considered suitable for acceptance, so the family was destroyed, was brutally okay. divided. It's just to give you an example of, of uh, this particular moment of history, which also explains uh, the, 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 the climate, the, 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 the sense of frustration, anger, uh, which alimented, it was a, a vent for, for creating more and more a sense of uh, kind of uh, radicalism, socialism, anarchism, uh, and this explains also, historically speaking, the several uh, episodes of bombing or assassinations or deportation. I would like, to, for example, to mention at least two moments of this history. The uh, famous bomb bombing at the post office in New York in June 1919, and even more, the bombing at Wall Street in 1920, uh, where many people died. Um, and many were wounded. Uh, if you go today, even today, to Wall Street, and you see the entrance on the wall, just before the entrance, you still see the holes of these bombs. This, uh, uh, they have remained as they are, as they were. And of course, this created also a climate, the weather, uh, an atmosphere of uh, hunt, uh, witch hunt, una caccia alle streghe, because uh, uh, of course uh, uh, the uh, government, uh, the police were exasperated, so they tried to collect as much the, as they could the, uh, not the, 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 the members of these associations, and they arrested, you know, tabula rasa, whatever was listed. So even though you were, you were living in Boston or in Chicago, you were arrested anyway. And I can mention one of the most famous episodes of uh, Nicola Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti. They were living in Boston, but they were members of, this, of these groups. And they were arrested because they, uh, they were just, they, they didn't speak a good English, by the way. And you know what happened to them. The, the, the trial went over for years, years. Eventually, they were killed. First put in jail. And only in the recent years, by the way, Dukakis, the governor Dukakis in Boston, recognized the innocence of these people, of Nicola uh, Sacco and Bartolomeo Lanzetti. <coughs> so this mixture of, uh, of ideologies uh, it should not surprise too much, because on the basis of this ideology, even though historically speaking, today, 2016, we can see the differences. We cannot put together, uh, I don't know, anarchism with uh, nationalism, with uh, fascism, with uh, futurism, uh, because now that we can make an historical objective analysis, we can see the ideological, the, the ideological uh, differences, but not 100 years ago, certainly. So 
it's not too much surprising what I'm trying to say that the mixture of this mixture of ideologies uh, provoked, unfortunately, many victims, often <coughs> innocent, and in a way, uh, especially after the bomb at Wall Street, that was the most uh, crucial one. Almost 40 people died, 39 people died, and more than 100 hospitalized. And this explains the the this particular <coughs> atmosphere in which many. By the way, I made a, a very detailed uh, research when I wrote my book at the New York Public Library, where we still have, we can find these magazines, and many of them are practically unreadable because the, the paper was the quality of a paper. So the uh, New York Public Library made all microfilms, which are in excellent reading shape. I can mention, for example, La Dunata dei Refrattari, L'Operaia, Il Proletariato, La Guardia Rossa. Uh, one of the most famous ones was called Il Martello, the Hammer, by Carlo Tresca, who was, being, was considered, uh, historically speaking, one of the most important leaders of these uh, radicals. He arrived, just for your uh, knowledge, your curiosity, in 1904, just three years after uh, Galliani. But also, uh, these magazines served also to cement, to create a more, s more solidarity among these uh, immigrants. And sometimes families played an important role to, to be together, to discuss together, and to find ways of solution. I would like to mention, for example, the Botto family. Botto family, Pietro and Maria Botto, uh, they were living in uh, uh, Patterson, New Jersey, where there was a very important uh, garment industry, especially for silk industry. And they, their house became a point of reference. Uh, there was uh, this uh, balcony, this porch, uh, porch on the second floor, and leaders would talk, Giovannetti would go there and speak, uh, Carlo Tresca would jump on this uh, balcony and speak to the crowds, try to uh, create a sense of uh, unification, solidarity among the workers. So this mixture of uh, different ideologies, in a way, uh, explain that at the, the bottom line uh, was the, the, the strong desire to have uh, better conditions of work, better conditions, better treatment uh, in their uh, jobs, a better life, and also more uh, protection and more uh, assistance, medical assistance, for example. I think it's time to move on a little bit to indicate you uh, an example, uh, an example through which uh, uh, we can uh, see one of the leading figures of this particular momentum, <coughs> of this very, I repeat, passionate period of Italian immigrants' experience. And I'm mentioning now, in fact, uh, one of the uh, protagonists that I speak in my book, his name is Arturo Giovanniti, who arrived in 1901. He was a very cultivated man. So differently from other companions who could ba barely read or write, he had a very good education. He was uh, studying theology at McGill University, Canada, but eventually he did not finish his studies and he moved to New York. And he became very, very soon, very quickly, one of the leaders, especially in the uh, Massachusetts area, New York area, Connecticut area, one of the leaders of the uh, uh, unions. And one episode, at least, should be mentioned about among his many, many activities. And this, this is a, a very famous strike that took place in Lawrence, Massachusetts, in 1912. Uh, it was a huge participation of workers, and unfortunately, 
during this uh, event, a woman was killed. A, a, a woman committed the one of a social worker. Her name was uh, uh, Anna Lopezzo or Lopizzo. I would say Lopezzo because in English there is a tendency if you say uh, Giuseppe, but it's not Giuseppe, it's Giuseppe, just to make an example. So I would imagine, I did some research and um, she was one of the most active uh, uh, women for human rights. So Anna Lopezzo was killed. And of course, since um, Arturo Giovannetti was the, the leader of this union, together with his friend, Hector, he was put in jail. And, but he could write in English, he could speak English. So when the time arrived of the process of the trial, he decided to refuse any lawyer, any attorney, and he defended himself because he thought that he could do so. During the period that he was in jail, he wrote several poems. He was a poet, a journalist, a prose writer, and also a dramatist, which is something that nobody knows. In fact, in Italy, many, uh, practically all of his works that he wrote in, in America are totally unknown still today. But anyway, uh, while in jail, he wrote a very uh, famous poem. I would like to read just a portion. Sorry that I moved from my microphone. I'm back. Uh, which became almost a flag, a symbolical flag for all workers in the world. And the poem was translated in uh, more than 20 languages at the time. So in a way, it became a cry for freedom, for justice. And what's the title of this long poem? It's titled The Walker. And it's very easy to read. I suggest you that you read. Uh, if you don't have my book, you can go to internet and you will find this poem. I'll read a portion of this poem, which is very much self-explanatory. It doesn't require a, a specific or a sophisticated uh, explanation. The walker. I hear footsteps over my head all night. They come and go. Again, they come and they go all night. They come one eternity in four paces. So we can imagine how small was the cell. They come one eternity in four paces and they go one eternity in four paces. And between the coming and the going, there is silence and the night and the infinite. For infinite are the nine feet of a prison cell, and endless is the march of he who walks between the yellow brick wall and the red iron gate, thinking things that cannot be chained and cannot be locked. But that wonder far away in the sunlight, each in a wild pilgrimage after a destined goal. Throughout the restless night, I hear these footsteps over my head. Who walks? I know not. It is the phantom of the jail the sleepless brain, a man, the man, the walker. One, two, three, four, four paces and the wall. One, two, three, four, four paces and the iron gate. He has measured his space. He has measured it accurately, scrupulously, minutely, as the hangman measure the rope and the grave digger, the coffin. So many feet, so many inches, so many fractions of inch for each and the four paces. One, two, three, four. Each step sounds heavy and hollow over my head. And the echo of each step sounds hollow within my head as I count them in suspense and in the dread that once, perhaps, in the endless walk, there might be five steps instead of four, 
between the yellow brick wall and the red iron gate. But he has measured the space so accurately, so scrupulously, so minutely, that nothing beats the great rhythm of the slow, fantastic march. Ah, uh, my brother, do not walk anymore. It is wrong to walk on a grave. It is a sacrilege to walk four steps from the headstone to the foot and four steps from the foot to the headstone. If you stop walking, my brother, no longer will this be a grave, for you will give me back my mind that is chained to your feet and the right to think my own thoughts. I implore you, my brother, for I am weary of the long vigil, weary of counting your steps, heavy with sleep. Stop, rest, sleep, my brother, for the dawn is well high and it is not the key alone that can throw open the gate. So it's an example of his writing, very uh, rhetorically uh, pushing, but you have to put this in the context, in the context of those times, in the context of rebellion, in the context of desiring to change the human conditions of these uh, workers. But this is just an example. He, uh, Arturo Giovanniti with his group was very much active, especially in the New York area. And at one point, they decided to create a magazine in order to you know, coagulate, to have people follow, the more followers. So they created a magazine which is very interesting. A magazine called Il Fuoco. This is the material that I photocopied from the microfilms at New York Public Library. I just show you the first <laughs> cover of the first uh, issue, September 20th, which is the date when I was born, by the way. September 20th, not the year. <laughs> <laughs> the year is 1914. So you see there is a kind of art deco. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, see, the images. Who were the, uh, he founded this uh, magazine together with a friend, Honorio Ruotolo. He was an artist, a sculptor, uh, making drawings and so on and so forth. So uh, Il Fuoco was a very important magazine in those years because it was able to put together more and more people who were frustrated and wanted to have a, a forum where to say their ideas. It was published in Italian and in English. Uh, sometimes some issues have more Italian than in English because they wanted to make a bridge to the Italians who could not speak yet English in, in America, in, in New York. And strangely enough, there is a very strong futurist presence. Now, what is futurism? Futurism is just in one minute because otherwise it becomes a seminar of this. Uh, futurism has been a very important avant-garde movement and uh, it was uh, published the first manifesto in 1909. The leader was Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. I'm going to read you just three short, very f short fragments of the first manifesto. Why? Because you will see, you will hear in a moment, some ideas that were repeated in this magazine. So that's a very interesting literary phenomenon, according to me, because I thought until I studied the Giovanniti and the Italian-American experience that futurism was mainly a phenomenon uh, European, you know, in Italian, but also uh, French, also Russian, because we have several futurism in Europe. Let me read, uh, let me quote just three short passages to give you an idea of this, uh, the activity of these futurists. Again, the leader was, the name of the leader was Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. That's what he writes. Up to now, literature has exalted a pensive immobility, ecstasy, sleep. We intend to exalt, instead, 
aggressive action, a feverish insomnia, the razor stride, the mortal leap, the punch, and the slap. We affirm that the word magnificence has been enriched by new beauty, the beauty of speed. We are at the beginning of the industrial era, right? So the first new cars, the first uh, uh, airplanes, inventions, and so on and so forth. So that's what he says now, very provoking. He, he wants to provoke the audience. A racing car, imagine a Maserati or a Ferrari. A racing car whose hood is adorned with great pipes, like serpents of explosive breath. A roaring car that seems to ride on gripshot is much more beautiful than the victory of Samutras. Now, victory of Samutras, for those of you who don't know, is a beautiful sculpture. When you go to the Louvre in Paris, you do the first escalier, then on the top you see this magnificent statue, Greek statue, which represents the victory, Nike di Samotracia. Nike is the Greek word for victory. And it was considered, still today considered, a beautiful uh, form, perfection, form of harmony of, the, uh, of the, the body of this woman. So in a way, historians have considered for centuries that that statue was in somehow the uh, archetype of beauty in terms of art. Then listen to this other fragment. Except in struggle, there is no more beauty. No work without an aggressive character can be a masterpiece. Poetry must be conceived as a violent attack of, on unknown forces to reduce and prostrate them before men. And then this one, then I stop, I return to Giovanni, but you will see the analogies. We glorify war, the world only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers. Beautiful ideas worth dying for and scorn for women. We will destroy museums, libraries, academies of every kind. We will fight moralism, feminism, every opportunistic or utilitarian cowardice. That's enough. Uh, the end. Lift up your heads erect on the summit of the world. Once again, we hurl defiance, sfida, no? challenge, to the stars. Now, these bombastic uh, uh, words that contained in the first manifesto of futurism <coughs> were echoing among these intellectual immigrants in America. And this is something that should be studied, I think, uh, because uh, we have uh, always relegated uh, futurism to uh, a, a, an Italian or European phenomenon. But actually, uh, futurists were very much influential also among some Italian Americans. When you read the Il Fuoco, for example, you find articles of Giovanni Papini, of Armando Mazza, Umberto Boccioni, uh, Luciano Folgore, Paolo Buzzi. These were all the impo most important protagonists of Italian futurism both in Milan and Florence. In Florence, the headquarters were with Papini, Soffici, Palzeschi, and so on. In Milan, Marinetti was the leader. And they were also able to involve American writers. So you see in, the, uh, in this magazine, Il Fuoco, the contributions of American writers, intellectual artists, artists very important, such as Alice Beach, John Sloan, Charles Winter, Glinton Camp, Art Young, Stuart Davis, and you see their contribution. They go, and they were working at the same time with the one of, maybe it is the most, the most radical magazine that at the time was published in America, titled The Masses. Perhaps you have heard. So radicalism, it is a kind of radicalism which is in between uh, pre-fascist uh, mood, uh, nationalist mood, socialist mood, altogether, that echoed the 
populist, anti-capitalistic, and anti-war ideology of the masses. However, the futurists were for the war, so see the mixture, the ambiguity, in a way. In fact, as I said a moment ago, we find the very same artist, same style, same satire, sarcastic verb, and graphics, very uh, eloquent graphics, used in the, in the magazine The Masses. Uh, the, the focus was uh, established in 1914, so we are getting close to the first war, right? So in the Christmas 1914 uh, special issue, we read this sentence. The Masses is the only modern, open-minded, and militant magazine in the United States. And the illustrations that they were, uh, I don't have the time to show you, are very eloquent in this sense. In other words, the, not only the writings themselves, but also the uh, sense of, of alienation, for example, the first introduction of the concept of machine that eventually, which now is happening, would replace men uh, labor. Uh, remember the film by uh, Charlie Chaplin, Modern Times, if some of you remember, you know what I'm talking about. So, uh, during the first period of this uh, journal, Il Fuoco, uh, Giovannitti's presence and influence was con consistently intense. He published poems, essays, pamphlets, dramas, translation and proclamations. Many of these are totally unknown in Italy, even though there is a book that was published by Martino Marazzi a few years ago, but contains only 20% of his incredible opus. Each contribution underscored the journal's inflexible social anarchistic position and vehement opposition to military intervention. And this, of course, was the socialist background of Giovannitti, because in Italy, we have the same. There was the interventisti and neutralisti for the war. Neutralisti were mainly represented by Giolitti. Giolitti was the leader, the president of the Consiglio, no? And he was a social, he was against, he was a neutralist. Eventually, the interventisti won, and they were able to involve our government to participate in the first war. So at this point, we see the birth, the first signs of a, a kind of ideological contrast <coughs> between Honorio Ruotolo, the co-founder of the journal, of the magazine Fuoco, and Giovannitti himself. So we are reaching now uh, next year, 1915, and in the issue number eight, which I have here, Ruotolo published an editorial titled Anche l'Italia nell'immane guerra, Italy II in enormous war, in which he explicitly stated that he favored Italian interventions, which is a position different from Giovanni. Then, in the very same edition, immediately following Ruotolo editorial piece, Giovannitti wrote a long, long article titled Fiamme, yes, Faville and Cenere, Flames, Sparks and Ashes, which was divided into several self-contained segments. In this article, Giovannitti clearly and sarcastically confirmed his pacifist. He was a kind of... Uh, uh, Gandhian, uh, follower of Gandhi theories of, of uh, peace, pacifistic, uh, pacifist um, uh, attitude, but also anarchistic and anti-militaristic position against the hypocritical American bourgeoisie and against any, you know, guerra fondai, we would say in Italian. In fact, uh, as a um, piece of provocation, he wrote a long poem, poet, poem titled the Desertore, the Deserter, reaffirming his inflexible anti-militarism and his position towards the war. As I said, this is the socialist Giolitti position on which, in which he believed. Uh, essentially, uh, Giovanni was a socialist. So this 
ideological contrast, they remained good friends in terms of human relation. But at that point, their roads divided, they split. Giovanniti's final split from Il Fuoco occurred in the following issue. We are in June now, 1915. In an open letter dated June 10, Giovanniti highlighted the irreconcilable, uh, irreconciliable that cannot be consigned conflict of political and social ideas that had always existed between him as a revolutionary socialist and his good friend Ruotolo as a discharged nationalist, feverish nationalist. And nationalists won eventually in Italy, but also in America, because the year after, as you know, the United States uh, entered the war. In this farewell letter, Giovanniti explained that the original philosophy of Il Fuoco had been to create a purely artistic and literary journal free. However, the unavoidable circumstance of the war, he said, has drastically changed these original intentions. I salute Honorio Rotolo, that's the fair piece of his farewell letter, who I consider a lifelong brother. I'm sure that when this bloody extermination is over, we will return, etc., etc., etc. I'm going a little bit to conclusion. Be patient with me. It's a very interesting subject. It's a very passionate subject. So with Giovanniti resignation, the subtitle of the final five issues, Il Fuoco, was changed. Uh, at the beginning was written, Il Fuoco, be weekly of art and literature, by weekly of art and literature. And it became by weekly nationalist. So this word was changed in order to underline the different ideology, the different course of this magazine. For his part, Giovanniti continued to re reiterate his anti-war and anti-militarist position and he, uh, as, as, as a form of uh, action, uh, he wanted to create another journal titled Vita, which means life. Rivista dei nostri giorni, magazine of our times. This new periodical, unfortunately, had a brief but very fervent, very mm, strong life, <coughs> very vivid life. He writes in the editorial note at the beginning, we are uh, 1915 now, September 30th. This periodical is the organ of all dissenters and all those uncompromising souls who still live a profound and spiritual life through their nature and who want at all costs to save their principles, passions, and psychological existence from the universal sinking of movements and ideologies, which the war is brutally affecting. The war, in fact, exists for us as a plug. It is a calamity that we want to combat after having understood it instead of passively submitting to it. We, and then he speaks uh, what they want, um, more uh, freedom, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the war has not changed our former attitude. We want to maintain our magnificent dream of human solidarity and justice, even now that war is raging all around us. Indeed, now more than ever, because at no other time in history was the ideal more needed above and beyond the horrid reality to individualize men and let them live in the intensity of themselves rather than turn them into automatons, robots, under the whip of a single collective madness. For us, the international labor movement is not dead. Let us begin, Italians of America. Let us again speak the supreme truth. And there is only one truth, great, universal, agreed upon, and understood by all, eternal and indestructible life. This explains the title, and with the title, this journal's agenda. Um, 
it's a passage uh, that seems, uh, when we read today, after 100, the, uh, 100 years later, a kind of rhetorical, sometimes even too much, a little bit bombastic. But you know, you have to put in the context of time. And you have to also to uh, see and read the, these passages together with the illustrations that accompany uh, these uh, statements. I would like to finish with a word on the women movement, which was Giovanniti to start in America. Giovanniti has been the one who started this movement. Very few people remember that. Uh, there is a very important article. Understand that um, American women could not vote until 1925, okay? Historically speaking, until 1925, women did not have a vote in the elections. And yet, they were working heavily, intensely, together with their families in factories everywhere. The contribution of women among immigrants' people has been immense, infinite. And I would like to recall your, call your attention just to this final note. There was a very important article in one of the uh, final issues, because the journal did not last too much, because at one point America entered the war, right? Uh, everything was finished, the socialist group uh, ended, the masses dissolved, and I will tell you in a second. But anyway, they, I'd like to um, submit to your attention an article titled Votes for Women, uh, which I will quote some portions in order to uh, give you an idea about how strong and committed was the, uh, the, the attitude of Giovanniti towards the women uh, emancipation. Giovanniti underscores in this article the social familiar restrictions still imposed upon women in 1915. First, he says, a married woman must relinquish her name in addition, the father has right over his children regardless of the mother wishes. For example, if they want to enlist in the army, emigrate, or even marry, the father has the final word. And again, a married woman cannot recognize her own child from a former husband without the permission of her present husband. Whereas, a man can recognize 100 such offspring without consulting his wife. Giovanniti gave recognition to more than six millions, six millions working women in America who paid taxes and contributed to the well-being of, being of society on a level neither higher nor lower than men. He urged women, women to fight for the right to vote. In addition, remember that the long road toward emancipation was yet to be traveled even for former black slaves who had fought next to Lee and Grant. He says, and uh, I will finish, the six million women mentioned above are not formidable enough proof, think of, of the woman, the woman who is driven from her home and thrown without mer mercy and without recognition into a ruthless world of economic competition and trade. In several states of the South, the situation is worse. Not only because the woman works, and works even more than the man, but her father or husband has the right to claim her salary. Capitalism has destroyed the family, consecrated the house, broken all ties of economic authority within the various branches of the family and brought all the children of the people to an equal level of degradation. Only complete equality between sexes, today would say genre, genders, based upon recognition of their unique and absolute right and duties may in time bring joy, peace, and respect to the home. Our workers are more likely to resent another codified and sanctioned indignity by the federal constitution, which solemnly declares, and this is what is, was written at the time, now finally has been canceled, 
the federal constitution say, declared that, quotation, criminals, felons, the insane, moral morons, and women, and women are excluded from the vote. Do you understand, my readers? Our mothers, our wives, our wives, our sisters are united in a historical document with criminals and idiots. Continuing um, campaign he did uh, until he was, uh, until and finally 1925, for a decade he fought for this. And he is one of the advocates and one of the, he was instrumental for changing the Constitution of America, and this very few people know, when finally, 1925, uh, under Roosevelt, if I'm not wrong, the... Um, Wilson. Wilson? Wilson. Thank you. Was uh, given the vote to women. We are approaching the year when America entered war, April 7th, 2010, and we see the gradual, uh, gradual dissolution, uh, weakening of various uh, factions of the fra fractions of the Union inside themselves. Uh, for example, the IWW, Independent World um, Worker World, was finished. Industrial Workers of the World, uh, and many important magazines were dissolved. One of these was the masses that I told you. Dozens of them disappeared. The masses, the proletarian, many, many others. The laws against the criminal syndical syndicalism, espionage, Act 1917, and sedition, 1918, brought almost every struggle for social justice to a standstill. Finally, the arrest in October 1917 of Arturo Giovannitti, Joseph Hector, Carlo Tresca, and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn for anti-American propaganda, <laughs> and the subsequent arrest four months later of the entire executive committee of the IWW did the rest. The sun was setting on an era of glorious revolutionary spirit to which Vita, the journal Vita, had also contributed. It was the beginning of a new era of general reform, and I'm talking now Roosevelt for sure, which would be supported by many trade unionists and socialist intellectuals from the first era. The fifth Congress of the Italian Socialist Federation, held in Brooklyn in 1921, and I'm finishing, officially resolved its own dissolution. Giovannitti, dearest friend, Flavio Venanzi, had died the year before, 1920, three months after that saw the, ar the arrest of Sacco and Vanzetti, I already spoke about them, for whom Giovannitti unsuccessfully had rallies, groups, protests, collected signatures, wrote and wrote several articles. Although his critical and creative work continued to resonate intermittently throughout the next three decades, Giovannitti began his complete and fragmented solitude, I would say, uh, of his life. So to finish, let me state this. Uh, this was, it has been, a great historical momentum for the advancement of American democracy, to which our Italian immigrants gave a significant contribution, as we have seen in their major leaders and as we have seen in, uh, as, as, as it was and still remain a man like Arturo Giovannitti. Thank you.